Once again, I would like to welcome everyone to this time of worship, and on behalf of the whole church, extend a, a hearty welcome to those who are here as guests. I would ask you to now, as you are able, to please rise and lift up your hearts to God. <clears throat> Congregation, from where does our help come? Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us sing together about the holiness of our God in the words of Hymn 5. Let us draw near to God and ask him to bless the opening of his word. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together again this afternoon by the power of your word and through the influence of your Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, we acknowledge that it's your truth, the truth of the gospel that has formed us into a congregation. And it's your truth that has drawn us here again this afternoon. We pray that the spirit of truth may dwell richly in all of our hearts. As he leads us and as he guides us, may we better understand the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. We pray, O oh Lord, that faith may live in all of our hearts, that as we hear the word, it would truly resonate with us. 
We pray, O Lord, that that would be true also for the younger members of our congregation. We ask you to work in the hearts of all the babies and the toddlers and the young boys and girls of our congregation who have been baptized into your name. And we pray, O Lord, that the Holy Spirit would awaken faith in their hearts also. May they come to understand and value the promises of the gospel which were sealed to them in their baptism. And Lord, even before they can understand the gospel, may they feel the gospel in their hearts through the love and the care of their fathers and mothers. Lord, we pray for a work of your spirit in the lives of all who are called to the office of being fathers and mothers. We pray that you would bless the work of Christian parenting that is happening every day in our midst. We pray, O Lord, that fathers and mothers would be well equipped through your word and spirit to transmit the truth and the values of the Holy Gospel to their children. We pray, O Lord, that parents may fulfill their calling not only through their words of instruction and exhortation and warning and comfort, but also through their example. We pray that the young people of the church may see displayed in the lives of their parents what it truly means to be a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of the kingdom of heaven. Father in heaven, we pray that parents may do their work with thoughtfulness, that they may do it with deliberate intent, and that they would display enduring passion to communicate to their children the truth of the gospel. Father, we pray for the boys and girls of the church also that they would truly honor their fathers and mothers, that they would respect them because they know that it is the Lord himself who has appointed their parents over them, and so help them to listen well to their parents. Even if they ask questions, may they ask them respectfully. If they disagree with their parents, may they disagree with a submissive attitude. May that be true, O Lord, not only of very young boys and girls, but but also of the teenagers in our midst. We ask that in this way, from generation to generation, your mighty deeds would be made known to your people and would be confessed by your people. Father, we give thanks this afternoon for the good news we heard of a baby born to Eric and Megan Vandergreen yesterday. We thank you for granting to them a daughter and for making everything well with our sister and with this little baby. Father, we marvel at your gift of life and we pray that you would give to our brother and sister everything they need to bring this child up together with their sons in the knowledge and fear of the Lord with respect for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We look forward to the little child's baptism, and we pray that in due time we may indeed witness that blessed event. Father, give us now ears to hear what your Spirit says to the churches. We pray that we may hear not just with our physical ears, but with our minds and with our hearts. And we ask, O Lord, that what we hear may become part of our lives. Give us the willingness to examine our lives and to do that not only individually, but also as a congregation. May we, O Lord, as a Christian congregation, always be ready to amend our lives. May we be ready to be changed and to conform our lives more and more to your revelation in Jesus Christ. Father, give us a good and blessed service, one in which your name is honored and glorified, and one in which we, your people, may be mightily strengthened. We ask it of you in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles this afternoon to the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is on page 1213 of your Pew Bible. We're reading this passage this afternoon in connection with the topic of the sermon which is church discipline. What does church discipline look like? What are its purposes? Well, we find a lot of 
revelation from God about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is the word of the Lord. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even tolerated among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So far the reading of God's holy word. Let us sing now about the holiness of God's congregation in the words of Psalm 15, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. I invite you now to turn to the Confession of the Church in the Heidelberg Catechism this afternoon to the second part of Lord's Day 31 on page 547 of the Book of Praise.
Just to get the context, we'll read again question and answer 83. What are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? The preaching of the holy gospel and church discipline. By these two, the kingdom of heaven is open to believers and closed to unbelievers. And then last time we gave our attention to the preaching of the gospel as a key of the kingdom of heaven. And today, number 85, how is the kingdom of heaven closed and opened by church discipline? According to the command of Christ, people who call themselves Christians but show themselves to be unchristian in doctrine or life are first repeatedly admonished in a brotherly manner. If they do not give up their errors or wickedness, they are re reported to the church, that is, to the elders. If they do not heed also their admonitions, they are forbidden the use of the sacraments, and they are excluded by the elders from the Christian congregation and by God himself from the kingdom of Christ. They are again received as members of Christ and of the church when they promise and show real amendment. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, uh, as we heard this morning, to be a believer in the Lord Jesus is that one and the same time to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. Every Christian is a disciple. And if you do not wish to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus, then you cannot be a Christian. This morning in Matthew 10, we saw particularly just how all-encompassing the call to discipleship really is. The Lord Jesus Christ taught us in that chapter that to be a disciple is really all or nothing. You can't be a partial disciple. You can't be a part-time disciple. You can't be a sporadic disciple. If you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, that means your entire life is called into the service of your Lord and Savior, and you want to consciously, deliberately, purposefully bring your entire life into submission to Jesus as your King. He's your Redeemer. He's your Savior. He's the one who died for you, but he's also the ruler of your whole life. Now, as you can know and testify from your own experience, learning to be a disciple is pretty challenging. Nobody learns to be a disciple in one day or one week or even one year. Learning to be a disciple is an ongoing part of the life of every Christian. And there are many factors that the Lord Jesus Christ uses to not just onward in our discipleship journey. Some of them are very familiar to us. We realize that we, we can't be faithful disciples without prayer. We know that it's impossible to be growing as a disciple if you're not busy with the Word of God. We know that we need to be part of the worship of God. We also can recognize the role of Christian fathers and mothers in nurturing discipleship in the hearts of their children. There are Christian schools. You can think of Christian schools in many ways, but one of the ways in which you may think of them as they're part of, part of that whole network of interrelated factors that promote discipleship. They help boys and girls and young people to grow up to be consciously committed to Jesus Christ. This afternoon in Lord's Day 31, there is another factor put before our hearts and minds that Jesus Christ has given us to nurture discipleship. It probably hasn't escaped your attention that the word discipline and the word disciple are related. They both come from the realm of education and both these words have to do with forming a person. We discipline, we disciple, those two aspects go together. And so I put it to you this afternoon that church discipline, far from being this this awful phenomenon that happens in fundamentalist churches involving terrible things like shunning and so forth. Actually, church discipline is a gift of Jesus Christ to help us in our journey of discipleship. And so I want to bring the Word of God to you this afternoon with this theme, church discipline keeps God's children on the, on the track of discipleship. That's the main idea that we'll focus on this afternoon. Church discipline keeps God's people on the track of discipleship. And we'll consider, first of all, the when of church discipline, then the how, and finally the why. First, then the when of church discipline. Well, Lord's Day 31 consists in part of a paraphrase of 
Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. In Matthew 18, in this famous chapter about church discipline, the Lord Jesus Christ says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. That's how it reads anyway in the English Standard Version that we use in our church. But it's interesting that if you go to some other Bible translations, you will see that it's worded a little differently. It says, for example, in the New American Standard Bible, if your brother sins, go and tell him his fault. And the words against you are missing. So Jesus is speaking in Matthew 18, not only of cases where someone sins against you, but he's speaking in a more general way of situations where somebody is sinning, where somebody is living, in the words of the catechism, a life that is not Christian. When someone is sinning, whether they're sinning directly against you or whether they are sinning in a more general way, not involving you, then says the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't ignore that. You need to go and and tell your brother or sister their fault. Now, what our Lord says in Matthew 18 is, is very clear. But having said that, it does raise some important questions as well. For example, I think of a passage such as 1 Peter 4, where in verse 8 we read, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. That's a little bit disconcerting when you've just read Matthew 18, verse 15, when your brother sins or your sister in the Lord, then go and tell him his fault. And 1 Peter 4, verse 8 says, Love covers a multitude of sins. So how, how does that work together? When does the process of Matthew 18 kick in? And, and when, on the other hand, do you just overlook and cover the sin of the person who's sinning? When do you feel God calling you to go and, and deliberately intervene? And when do you just say, well, you know what? That's, that's not right, but that's just Christian weakness and, and I'm not getting involved. Well, to answer that question, it is certainly not the case that the Lord Jesus Christ wants you to get involved in the life of your brother or sister every single time you notice some type of sin. That's not what Jesus is saying. It is indeed the nature of love to overlook and to cover many sins. Minor sins, I would say. The minor sins of daily life, the minor sins of weakness that we all reveal in our thoughts and words and in our deeds. When you're experiencing these minor sins of weakness that just belong to life of of all Christians, then the operative rule is not go and tell your brother his fault. Then the operative rule is love covers a multitude of sins. Now, sometimes it's really tricky to know the difference. And so let's try to work that out a little bit. What sort of weaknesses should you be ready to just overlook for the sake of love and which require you to boldly intervene? What happens, for example, if a fellow Christian or or family member displays to you in a certain situation impatience? Impatience is a sin, isn't it? The Bible teaches very clearly that love is patient, And therefore, a lack of patience is a failure of love, and it's a sin. But does that mean that every single time somebody is impatient with you, maybe maybe a couple's heading out the door, and the husband is impatient with his wife because she's not ready on time? Well, I would put it to you that that's the kind of situation that the Bible says you, you cover those things in love. You just let it go. You overlook it for Christ's sake. But if there's a pattern of impatience, if it's a lifestyle in which you're, you're constantly experiencing the impatience of another person, then there arises a necessity for you to speak boldly to that sin, to intervene, and to say, no, that's not just weakness. That's not just something that we have to accept as fellow Christians from one another. Or if somebody says a sharp word to you in an argument, I don't think you right away have to invoke Matthew 18. But if they're always saying sharp words to you and it's a pattern and you're always on the receiving end of their little outbursts of anger, well, that's, that's beyond just a sin of weakness. That's an entrenched sin 
And then your duty becomes to intervene boldly, according to Matthew 18. More examples. Let's suppose you're at a party, and there's somebody there, a fellow partier, and you can tell by 10.30 at night that that person's had one drink too many. Are you required to immediately intervene and phone that person up the next morning and say, you know, I have to come and speak a word to you? Or do you chalk it up to immaturity and lack of judgment? I would suggest probably the latter. Probably the latter. You just chalk it up to immaturity and judgment. But if it happens again next week, and then the week after that, then, then some red flags are starting to go on, up, and then the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you to intervene boldly with your brother or sister. Why? Because they are straying from the path of discipleship. Because they are not just showing weakness, but they are living unchristianly. Now, sometimes people might respond to this by saying, but, but aren't all sins equal? And I would say, no, they're not. All sins are not equal. Sins are very different. Some are sins of weakness. Some are very severe sins of deliberate rebellion against God. They're not the same. Sins have differences between them. Yes, every sin has a similar component in that every sin is a failure to fully honor God, but it's a fact that some sins are more egregious than others. Some sins can be covered in love, and some sins cannot be covered in love, but some sins need to have the response of you consciously, deliberately communicating your concern. Now, it's also worth saying that the sorts of sins that the Lord Jesus has in mind in Matthew 18 are, are not just moral transgressions. I think that's a really important point to make. It's not just moral failures that Christ has in mind here. The Lord Jesus Christ is thinking in a very broad way about sin. He's thinking about sins that are moral, but sins also of the mind, sins of doctrine, sins of what you think. For example, let's suppose it happened that at, at Bible study, somebody articulated the idea that in the end, at the last judgment, every single human being will be saved. Now, you might think, well, that's a crazy idea for any Christian to hold, but in fact, in, in the broader Christian world, there are plenty of people who embrace this error of universalism. They believe that in the end of days, the last judgment, every single person, whether they consciously have faith in their life or not, will be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and will be saved and will enter the kingdom of God. So someone's saying this at Bible study and articulating this quite forcefully, and they won't back away from it. Well, you know, that's a, that's a sin, because that's a teaching that goes directly against the Word of God. And then your duty is not to ignore it, not to pretend you didn't hear it, but your duty is to go to that person and have a brotherly conversation, a sisterly communication with that individual, and try to press upon them the seriousness of this doctrinal error that they are wanting to espouse in the body of Christ. So that's a little bit about the when of church discipline. Let's go on to move to the how of church discipline. Well, staying with Matthew 18, referred to here in Lord's Day 31, the, the initial principle that Jesus Christ wants us all to work with is that in church discipline, when we are communicating concerns about the life, the conduct, and the, and the beliefs of a fellow member, the principle is to keep the circle as small, as tight as possible. And that's why Jesus says, if anyone sins, go and tell him his fault between him and you alone. Just go and tell that person in all privacy, in all confidence, about the concerns you have regarding their life or their conduct. Now, sometimes we can speed church discipline up a little bit. For example, if something is a public scandal in the body of Christ, if there is some sin that is far from hidden or private or only known by a few, if the sin is known by the community as a whole, then we don't have to go through all the steps of Matthew 18. But then the requirement is speedy intervention by the whole body of Christ and also by the leaders of the body of Christ. But going back to situations where the sin is less known and is perhaps known only in a small circle or only by you, then Jesus says, listen, keep the circle small, keep the circle tight, 
The one thing you may not do, you are forbidden to do, is to go and talk to all and everyone about your concerns, about the lifestyle or the doctrinal errors of a fellow member. Jesus says, you may not do that. And when you do it anyway, do you know what you're doing? You're gossiping. You see, gossiping isn't only the telling of lies about other people. Gossiping is often the telling of truth about other people, but telling it in context where you're not supposed to be telling it. And I would say that gossip is the lazy man's answer to church discipline. It's, it's the coward's alternative to church discipline. Because, you know, it doesn't take any courage at all to gossip. You'll always find people ready to hear gossip. Somehow we're wired that way, and it's one of the most perverse aspects of human beings, that we love to hear bad stuff about other people. But gossiping is a sin. And it's the devil's alternative and the coward's alternative to church discipline. Sometimes it happens that when we have concerns about someone else in the body of Christ, then we talk to just about anybody except that person. And you know what that actually means? It actually means you're not that concerned about that person. You're not that concerned. You're pretending to be and you act like this is a big deal, but you're not even concerned enough to give them a phone call and take them for coffee and tell them of your, your, your fears about their conduct or their doctrine. And so you don't really care about them. You care more about your ability to create a, an impression because it creates an impression when you've got a story, the juicier the better, to share with other people. That creates an impression and you always have people eating out of your hand to hear such stories. Um, that you don't really love the person you're concerned about. You're just a fraud. You're a fake. You're not really concerned. Instead of gossiping, says Jesus, we are to go to directly meet up with the person whom we're concerned about and with great humility and much prayer, we are to tell them their fault. And I would say to you, when you are in that stage of church discipline, then also be very ready, be very ready to hear the other side of the story. Because you know, sometimes when you actually talk to a person and you share with them your concern, then just like that, in a few moments of conversation, you get a totally different impression because you are unaware of extenuating circumstances. You are unaware, perhaps, of the context. Or perhaps you misread a situation. You thought you heard something that actually you didn't hear, or you thought you saw something that you didn't actually see. And so when you go to tell a brother or sister their fault, go with an awareness and a readiness to admit that maybe you had it all wrong. Maybe you had it all wrong. But if your facts are correct, and they're not challenged, and if there really is sin involved, then you must go forward with your exhortation, your admonition, your warnings. And you do that, of course, with the, with the great longing that the person would listen to you. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 18. If he listens to you, then you have gained your brother or sister. However, sad to admit, and we all know this from experience, listening does not come easily to any of us. The vast majority of human beings are not good listeners at all. And that includes every one of us here. By nature, not one of us are good listeners. What happens when people want to challenge us or correct us, even if they come with humility and gentleness? What happens is that we tend very quickly to become defensive, we engage in denial. Instead of dealing head on with what's being said to us, we do anything to avoid it. So being able to listen to what someone is saying to you out of loving concern is a spiritual uh, possibility that, that only the Holy Spirit can enable us to display. See, when the Spirit of God is working in your heart and you are full of the Spirit and you are humble, then your first concern is not going to be to somehow protect your image. Your first concern is going to be the glory of Jesus Christ and His image being formed in you. You see, when you are living a truly Christ-centered life, when your greatest desire in life is not to have everybody in awe of you, 
and to be amazed by your Christian walk, when your greatest desire in life is that Jesus Christ would be honored, then you know what it really should be like? It should really be like this. And maybe this seems like a totally impossible ideal, but I'll put it out there anyway. It really should be like this, that when people come to you and express a concern to you, that you would say, dear brother, dear sister in the Lord, thank you. Thank you for coming to visit me. And thank you for expressing my or expressing your concern about my, my, my lifestyle or, or my thoughts or some specific words that I've said. Can you imagine being a person like that that would welcome criticism? I read the other day about a young hockey player who said that he welcomed criticism because he wanted to be the best hockey player he could be. And so he welcomed the criticism of his coach. He welcomed the criticism of the older players. He welcomed the criticism of the media because... He wanted to learn from this criticism to be the best hockey player he could possibly be. And he knew that he couldn't be the best hockey player he could be without criticism. And so when people come to you, not with criticism, but with loving concern and care, should we all aspire to become the kind of people who would say, Lord Jesus, thank you for placing me in a congregation where there are people who actually care that much about me that they would get out of their comfort zone and do something potentially dangerous to speak to me about my life, about my thoughts and my deeds. That would, that would be a real expression of wisdom, wouldn't it? A wise man always desires to be wiser, says the proverb. And would that we were all wise men and wise women. But the fact is, we're not all very wise persons. And so when you do bring a word of exhortation to a fellow member of the body of Christ, they're not always going to say thank you very much. Sometimes they're going to do all the things we've already identified. They're going to deny. They're going to make excuses. They're going to minimize. They're going to pretend it's no big deal. And they're going to do everything possible to, to not engage with you about the issue at hand. Well, says Jesus, when that happens, then you need to escalate the situation. Then the circle gets a little bit wider. It's not so tight and narrow anymore. Then you bring two or three witnesses, says Jesus. And these don't necessarily need to be witnesses to the actual sin that was committed. But they need to be witnesses to the exhortation that is being brought. They are there to intensify the pressure. So, for example, let's suppose you bring a concern to somebody and they brush it off and say, I don't know why you're talking to me about this. This is no big deal. And they try to act like, oh, this, this is just normal. This is just what Christians are, are like. Then you bring along two or three witnesses. And these two or three witnesses can, can verify the, this, the critical nature of the issue. And they can make it much more difficult for the person to just brush off your concerns. Try to imagine this. Try to imagine what it would be like to have not just one person, but two or three coming to your front door and entering your house and trying to call you out on some sin in your life. You would think that would make a big impression on you. You would think that. You would think that, of course, of course Christians are going to listen to other Christians when they come with that level of concern. And thanks be to God, they sometimes do. Maybe even quite often they do. Maybe quite often they, they may not appreciate it right away, but maybe after a week or two or a month, they might get back to you and say, you know, I really appreciate that you came and expressed your concerns, and I've taken them to heart. Thanks be to God that that happens. But there are some times when people don't take those concerns to heart, even with the escalation of two or three witnesses. And then says the Lord Jesus, you are to ramp up the pressure even more. You are to tell it to the church. And what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean you come here on Sunday morning and start blabbing about it to everybody in the church hall. It means that you approach the leadership of the church in a formal way and let them know what has happened and what you have been doing about what has happened and what the outcome has been. Church leaders will probably ask you a few questions like, so tell us exactly in what way you have engaged this brother or sister. How have you attempted on your own to to communicate your concerns to this person because the church leaders know they ought not to be involved prematurely. And sometimes they might say, you know what, I, I really think you need to go and, 
and have a conversation again with this person. But if the church leaders are convinced that you have done everything the Lord Jesus Christ lays upon us in Matthew 18, then they will take on the matter and they will make a visit. Sometimes they will make two, sometimes they'll make five, sometimes they'll make 25. I know one church leader who made 99 visits in a matter of Christian discipline. 99 times he went to seek out that strange sheep. Incredible. It's an incredible level of commitment. Because every time he, he, he hopefully discerned a softening, he hopefully discerned a little bit of listening, the little bit of beginning of repentance. And so he went again, and he went again, and again, over and over and over. And when the work of the elders does not bring about the desired fruit, then, says the Lord Jesus Christ, you are to consider him, that person, that sinner, whether male or female, you are to consider him or her as a Gentile and as a tax collector. And you know what that means? That's a sharp way of saying you are to consider that person to be, from now on, an outsider to the body of Christ. And that has some pretty severe repercussions. If someone is excommunicated from the church, they're still welcome to attend here. And if they want to, we should never discourage them. We should even invite them to the worship of God. But they may not partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. If children are born to them, they may not have their children baptized. If there's a congregational meeting, they may not vote. They have lost the privileges of membership in the body of Christ. Now, sometimes it happens, and I think in, in our modern era, this, this happens almost invariably. Before someone is actually excommunicated, they, they send a letter, maybe even just one brief line to the leadership of the church, I hereby withdraw my membership from the Alder Grove Canadian Reformed Church or whatever other church they may be a member of. They say thereby that they don't want to belong to the church anymore. They don't want to be part of the body. Well, I would say to you that if these people are withdrawing their membership while they are under the discipline of the church, then they are excommunicating themselves. And then you are to regard them exactly as an excommunicated person. You are to regard them as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, as a non-member, a non-member of the body of Christ. And we read in 1 Corinthians 5, the repeated exhortation of the Apostle Paul, do not associate with people like that, with people who are living compromised lives and people who have been cast out of the body of Christ. He says, do not associate with them. He makes a distinction in verse 9 and 10 about associating with sinful people of the world. He says, that's inevitable. You can't help but associate with people of the world who are sinful because you you meet them in business, you meet them in the marketplace, you meet them in the universities, the schools, in the community. You can't live without contact and association with non-Christian people who are living compromised lives. But Paul specifically says, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 5, I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, and then he spells it out, not even to eat with such a one. Not even to eat. That means not to have intimate expressions of communal life with such a person. Now that's sometimes really hard to figure out how to apply that in a certain situation. How do you interact with people who have been under the discipline of the church and then withdrew while under discipline? How do you, how do you interact with people who have been excommunicated? Can you still have them over for your Christmas party? What about if they're family members? Can you still act friendly to them? What about birthday parties? What about any type of community event? Well, you know what? I'm afraid you're going to have to think that through for yourself. I don't have a whole bunch of rules here to give you to apply exactly in every situation. But there is a principle at 1 Corinthians 5, and that principle is not to associate. And the word associated here means to have the kind of intimate connectivity that you are accustomed to having with each other in the body of Christ. Very harsh words. Do not associate. They sound so incredibly unfriendly. But look at it the other way around. 
when someone is living in sin, when they have ignored the exhortation of the first person who came to them and then the two or three witnesses, and they've ignored the exhortations of that pastor who went 99 times on pastoral visits to one sheep. They've ignored all of that. They've rejected it. They refuse to amend their lives. And then they come back to the church community and everybody acts like everything's fine. Does that make any sense? Is that loving to treat people as though everything is fine when they are living in flagrant contradiction of the will of Jesus Christ? I don't think that's loving at all. It's not loving to carry on with entirely normal relationships when someone who wants to be regarded as a Christian is living in fundamental denial of Christian beliefs and Christian doctrine. See, the whole, point of, the whole point of church discipline is to let the sinner know things are not normal between you and us. Things are not normal. And the sinner has to feel that. And how exactly you work that out in your personal life, I'm not here to tell you. But the principle is the sinner has to feel that things are not normal. There's, there's a breach in the fellowship. There's something fundamentally broken. Finally, we consider the why of Christian discipline. First place, the goal of church discipline is the restoration of the brother or sister. That's what Jesus says. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he continues on that path, you've lost him. But if you lovingly intervene and confront him and he listens and he says, thank you, then you have gained your brother. The bond is restored. This brother is restored to God. He's restored to the community of the church. It's the fact that church discipline is the most loving thing that can be done. We read in Hebrews chapter 11 that God is a disciplinarian. Let me quote Hebrews, or chapter 12 rather. God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in holiness. The apostle continues, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So that's the loving goal of church discipline. The loving goal of church discipline is to bring back a wayward disciple to the right path, the path of discipleship, so that this fellow member is now following the Lord Jesus Christ again with integrity. And the result of that would be a beautiful thing for that person. More and more, the disciple is becoming Christ-like. And that's your goal. Your goal in intervening in the life of a fellow member is that that fellow member would become increasingly Christ-like, conformed to the image of God in Jesus Christ. But there are other goals as well. Second goal of church discipline is to protect the body of Christ. I think parents know that if you let things go, then bad things spread among your children. If you let one kid get away with having a big mouth, then that attitude tends to spread in the, in the, in the household. Well, you know what? It's exactly the same in the body of Christ. When sin is unchecked, it spreads. It spreads like an infection in your body. If you have an infection in your big toe, it might not look like a big thing. After all, it's your big toe far away from the important organs of your body. But if that infection in your big toe is, in, is unchecked, well, guess what? Pretty soon you'll see red lines going up your leg. And before you know it, you're dealing with amputation or death. Because infections spread. And when someone in the congregation is living an unchristian life, not just sins of weakness, but fundamental denials of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the church overlooks that the church pretends it's not happening. Nobody wants to get their hands dirty. Nobody wants to get in the face of their brother or sister, so to speak. Then that sin will spread. You, will, you can count on it. And people will pretty soon become nonchalant about the most outrageous sins that actually happens. And finally, the highest goal of church discipline is Jesus Christ's honor, Jesus Christ's glory. Because who are you? You are the people of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what the world thinks about the Lord Jesus Christ is often determined by what they think of you, the ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're his people, you're his disciples, you represent him in the world. And as they think about you, so they will think of the Lord Jesus. 
And so if you're living a deeply compromised life and you are not in any way reflecting anymore the image of Jesus Christ, then the world is getting a very bad impression of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the worst thing of all. When the name of God is blasphemed, brought into disrepute because of the life of the members of the church. So if you love Jesus, and you don't just say you love Jesus, but you really do love Jesus, and the honor of Jesus is of supreme importance to you, and the reputation of Jesus, his glorious name, if that is precious to you, then I put it to you, you will overcome your scruples, and you'll rediscover your courage, and you will make that phone call, and you will tap that brother or sister on the shoulder, and you will sit down, and you will humbly and gently and yet clearly tell that brother or sister his fault. I hope we can see now that church discipline is a remedy given by Jesus Christ for the preservation of his people. It's given to all of you to help you stay on track as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's a reality that people can't grow without each other. You can't grow without other Christians. Maybe you think you can. Maybe you think you can grow without ever having meaningful connectivity with other Christians, but the fact is you can't. The Lord Jesus Christ builds us up in our faith. He builds us up in our godliness in many ways, and one of the prime ways is through the gift of each other. Through the gift of each other, he gives us each other to watch over one another. It's the kind of language that's very common in the Bible, watch over each other. And that doesn't mean to micro-scrutinize every step of your brother or sister's way, but it means to live with awareness and, and to discern things that are obvious and not to overlook them. So instead of seeing church discipline as something odious, something that only weird fundamentalist churches still practice, let's take it as part of the revelation of God and let us take it as a gift of Jesus Christ that we all benefit from when we apply it faithfully. It's a necessary tool to help us grow as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the blessing. The blessing and not the curse of church discipline. Amen. Let us sing in response to the Word of God from the book of Psalms, Psalm 18. Psalm 18 stands as 7 and 8.
Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you for placing all of us in the fellowship of your church. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry which we have toward each other, a ministry to encourage one another, to comfort, a ministry to give practical help, and to generally be supportive of our respective lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. Lord, we acknowledge that we are often quite individualistic. We fall prey, Lord, to the idea that we can do well as believers on our own, that we don't really need each other. We don't need people to minister to us. We also fall prey to selfishness when we fail to provide for others the help and encouragement which they need. But Lord, we also show our selfishness and our individualism when we fail to deal with each other's sins, when we fail to exhort people who are sinning, or when we don't let them exhort us, then we are showing how profoundly individualistic and selfish we really have become. Father, please forgive the many ways in which we are not really functioning all that well as the body of Christ in this place. Please give us a stronger love for one another and a stronger commitment to defending the glorious name of Jesus. And we pray that all of us would learn the spiritual discipline, indeed the spiritual art of ministering to each other, to do that with all humility, with all gentleness, with brotherly love in our hearts, but also with all candidness, with all sincerity, and with all directness. Help us, O Lord, to become the sort of people that are spoken of in the book of Proverbs. We read often in the book of Proverbs about wise men welcoming the reproach of others because it will help them to be wiser still. Lord, that's very difficult for us to do, but we pray that in this coming week we may think of this often. And so instead of being defensive quickly, instead of responding to criticism or suggestions with anger that we would be ready to learn. Help us, O Lord, to get out of the trap of always having to protect our own image. Indeed, may our greatest concern be that of the image of Christ, that it would be formed in us. We pray that by means of the tool of church discipline, all of us would be empowered to live more fully the life of a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we pray this afternoon for the leadership of our congregation. Please give wisdom and courage to the elders and deacons and the pastor who together are called to oversee the life of our congregation. Lord, may they do their work faithfully with the joy of the Lord in their hearts. We pray that we would be a well-governed congregation. We also pray, Lord, that men in the church would aspire to leadership, that they would desire the offices of the eldership and of being a deacon. And we also pray that they would have the commitment to personal growth that is necessary to serve in this way in the body of Christ. Father, we pray this afternoon also that you would raise up from among your people preachers of the word. O oh Lord, stir up in the hearts of many brothers a desire to become preachers of the gospel. We pray for the work of the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary in Hamilton. O oh Lord, bless all the professors with good health and strength. Give them wisdom and courage for their work of equipping, this, equipping others for ministry. And bless also the students who are currently enrolled. enrolled enable them to keep growing in knowledge and wisdom and maturity so that in due time they may be called and sent out to preach the glad tidings of the kingdom of heaven. Heavenly Father, bless also the Board of Governors, which on behalf of all of the churches oversees the work of the seminary. Give the Board the vision and the wisdom it needs to help the seminary to be faithful and to keep growing and serving the community which supports it. Lord, as we're soon to go home now, we will begin thinking about the week that lies ahead of us. We'll soon be thinking about our work for the coming week. 
We thank you for the work which you have given us to do. And whatever you put before us, O oh Lord God, may we do with all of our heart, recognizing that in Jesus Christ our labor is never in vain. May our work bring benefit to our neighbors. May it help to promote justice and peace and well-being in our community, in our nation. We pray also, O oh Lord, for Christian schools. We pray for education, the education of our children, that it would truly be anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one through whom all things were made, the one also in whom all things hold together. Lord, give parents and teachers and school boards the ability to express and work out in all aspects of schooling a truly godly vision for what education is all about. Father in heaven, bless us now as we go forth to our homes and into the world. Help us to remember that the world into which we are entering is a terrain of mission. And so may we be watchful for every opportunity to speak of the blessed name of Jesus. May we be given many opportunities to share the glad tidings. And when those opportunities come, may we seize them boldly. May we speak freely and confidently about who our Savior is, and about what he has accomplished. And we pray that you will use us through our words, through our testimony, and also through our deeds to win many of our neighbors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, grant us a good Sunday evening. We pray this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Having heard the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed to us and administered to us in the sacrament this morning, let us now prepare our hearts to listen to the reading of God's covenant law. These laws are the norm for those who have been redeemed in the blood of Jesus Christ. This morning or this afternoon, we hear the law of God is found in Exodus 20. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus Christ has summarized these laws of God in Matthew 22 when he was asked the question, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Our Savior replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So, Father, reading of the law of God, let us sing in response to the law of God from Psalm 25, and not stanzas 5 through 7. We, say, we sang stanza 5 this morning. We'll sing instead stanzas 6 and 7 of Psalm 25.
You are now given an opportunity to bring your offerings of gratitude. Once again, they will be received, your gifts will be received for the support of the Ministry of Mercy within the church and outside of the church. And lastly, let us sing then from hymn 49, the Spirit sent from heaven above shows us the way of truth and love. Hymn 49, all stanzas. to the Lord your God, receive his blessing and go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.